Welcome to Bear Paw Media and Education's Public Legal Education webinar series. My name is Nadine Callahoo Hansen. Bear Paw Media and Education is a Department of Native Counseling Services of Alberta, and our primary goals are to make public legal education understandable, accessible, and affordable for Indigenous people. We at Bear Paw are not lawyers, although we do endeavor to make sure that this information is correct and current to the best of our abilities and is edited by lawyers. Of course, laws change with elections and societal values. So this information is designed to be general in nature and may not apply to your specific situation. It may still be necessary to consult a lawyer for legal advice to assist you. For more information, you can go to our website at bearpawlegalresources.ca or follow us on social media at Bear Paw Legal. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land in which we gather is Treaty 6 territory and a traditional meeting ground and home for many Indigenous people, including Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, and Dakota Sioux. Today's topic will be reclaiming Indian status according to our current legislation, Bill S-3. My name is Woman Who Stands Strong. I am from the Anishinaabe community in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. When I was a very young girl in the family that adopted me, I always was curious about why I was a different color. Even though that wasn't ever an issue with them, they never said that I was different. I just understood and knew that just from my own perspective of being in that family. There wasn't anything taught in school around Indigenous families or First Nations or First People. My heart wanted to know who my family was and where I belonged and, and, and what my purpose was in this world. My name is Amanda Middleton. I was born Amanda Vandell, basically born and raised in the Edmonton area. Come on, Pop. I love living out here on the acreage. Uh, we have Saskatoons that uh, we enjoy and lots of animals. For my grandmother to lose her status for marrying a non-status man, because granddad was Métis, so, you know, she was marrying somebody uh, similar bloodlines, I guess, to her, but he just wasn't recognized as status. I think it was, you know, very sexist for, for the government to take away her status for whom she married. These are my grandparents, so we have Elizabeth Callahoo, and she married Ben Vandell. I believe this is their 50th anniversary picture. I hear they had a beautiful love story all through their marriage. They went on to have 10 children. At one point in time, they were living on the Michelle Band Reserve, but moved off of the reserve when they were told to send their children to residential school in St. Albert. My name is Lynn Gale and um, I'm an Algonquin from the Ottawa River Valley. I'm a Turtle Clan member and um, the work I do as a writer, as an activist, as an artist revolves around uh, Indigenous rights, Algonquin rights, land claim and self-government process versus the treaty process, sex discrimination in the Indian Act and giving more currency to Indigenous knowledge. My passion and my interest is in Indigenous governance, but more specifically my, uh, my current passion is in how um, we practice Indigenous governance in the present and what changes we need to make in order to create just and fair systems of governance for First Nation and Indigenous peoples moving into the future. Bands often contain people from diverse backgrounds, so you didn't have an encampment with just Cree people, or say Assiniboine or Soto people, you had people uh, mixed into groups, and even the Métis were often part of uh, bands or encampments as well. Sometimes what could happen is, depending on who your parents were, 
is that you might have an affiliation with more than one uh, identity. And so what it meant is it, is it created a level of diversity within the prairie indigenous landscape for how people came to identify. And there was a level of fluidity for how people um, thought of themselves and it could change over the course of one's lifetime. But again, it created this flexibility where citizenship was inclusive and it was something that was able to be oriented around people's choice and around having leadership that was fair and just that allowed people to be able to choose where they lived. During colonial settlement, Indigenous nations were acknowledged through nation-to-nation -nation treaties with the British and the French. This was also stated in the Royal Proclamation of 1763. Through the expansion of British control over the colonies and the development of Canadian society, Indigenous people were understood as barriers to the nation's growth and success. As a result, Canada's Gradual Enfranchisement Act in 1869 and the Indian Act in 1876 created restrictive definitions of who was an Indian or a band member. These laws discriminated against Indian women by removing their status if they married a non-Indian man. Indian women who were stripped of their Indian status were not permitted to live on reserve. Their children and future descendants were also not eligible to have Indian status. Further restrictions to access to Indian status caused Indigenous kinship systems and communities to suffer as it severed family ties. Without the support of community and family relationships, as well as cultural connections, women and their children became more vulnerable living in Canadian society. I've made a lot of efforts to learn who I am as an Indigenous person and learn about Indigenous knowledge philosophy and what is it and how does it differ from Western knowledge systems. As you move more deeply into it, you become more confident in who you are as an Indigenous person. So this is my, um, what I call my Treaty at Niagara Wampum Bundle. It's really special to me. I made this as part of my PhD work um, on the Algonquin land claim and self-government process. I went to graduate school and at the master's level, I, my topic was identity. And I looked at the issue of blood quantum, uh, phenotype physiology, meaning how you look, and Indian status. And I looked at how those colonial definitions of who we are, how they're harmful to us. They're, of course, they're harmful to our nations and our, and our right to, to be self-determining people. But they also harm us spiritually and emotionally and physically. The main interest the Canadian government has had in legislating Indigenous identity has been to see Indigenous identity, at least from a legal and a political perspective, eventually cease to exist. This was accomplished through a wide um, variety of manner. So for one, First Nations people and Métis people were racially separated. The main reason to create this racial distinction between First Nations and Métis people was in order to be able to separate people off so you wouldn't have the strong kinship bonds. And through creating these distinctions, hopefully over time, it would make it easier to assimilate each group and eliminate their political and legal status within Canadian society. The discrimination that took place in some cases drove families apart and uh, clearly denied rights. And the ongoing existence of the Indian Act and the fact that Canada is the sole authority on who is determined to be a status Indian, and that, that's just wrong. In 1951, the Indian Act was amended to create a single Indian register, a list of all those with status run by the federal government instead of by Indian bands. The Indian Registrar, a government office, holds the power to add or delete names from the register. At this time, when an Indian man was added or deleted from the register, his wife and children were also deleted or added. In an effort to further control how status could be passed down through the male line, the double mother rule was created. This meant if an Indian man married a non-Indian woman, she became a status Indian. The rule also allowed the father to pass on Indian status to his children. If a male Indian child of these parents also married a non-Indian woman, they would also be able to pass on Indian status to their children, but these children would be stripped of their Indian status at age 21. The amendments to the Indian Act in 1951 maintained the previous sex discrimination towards Indian women who married non-Indian men. Women still lost their Indian status if they married a non-Indian man, while Indian men retained it and could pass on their status if they married non-Indian women. 
The big effect of this, as we know now, is that uh, thousands of uh, people, indigenous people, lost their status. Many indigenous women who were disenfranchised prior to 1951 continued to live on the reserve. And it was the changes to the Indian Act in 1951, which created very strict rules, which often forced women uh, off reserve. My great-grandmother's name was Annie Jane Manass, and my grandmother's name was Viola Gagne. They were from Golden Lake First Nation, now called Pickwakanagan First Nation. Annie Jane Manass lived there with her husband, Joseph Gagne, and Joseph Gagne was also Algonquin. He went to war, and when he came back, they were escorted off the reserve. And the reason they were escorted off the reserve was because Joseph Gagne was only Indian through his mother, not his father. Once a woman married out, she, she no longer became an Indian. Although they were escorted off the reserve, my father still considered Golden Lake his community, and uh, that's where his heart was. He was denied the pride, pride of being indigenous. He was denied the uh, pride of being a human. See, they took away, um, they took away his dignity. Our women are suffering because of that fact that, you know, they did come in and, and just take it from us without any right. There's just a horrible gender-based discrimination in the application by Canada of the Indian Act. Canada shouldn't have the authority to determine who is, quote unquote, an Indian and who has, you know, rights to uh, access to treaty rights and to, uh, and to status rights. So, uh, you know, what should happen to the Indian Act? As the legal definition of who was entitled to be an Indian was more narrowly defined, sex discrimination continued to grow towards women who lost their status. As a response to the sex discrimination, many women across the country started to rally and take legal action against these injustices. Mary Tuax Early was an influential leader in the 1960s. She lobbied for changes to the Indian Act by organizing the social political organization Indian Women for Indian Rights, which grew across the country. In the 1970s, both Jeanette corbier laval and Yvonne Bedard took their equality cases for removal of Indian status to the Supreme Court of Canada and lost. From 1977 to 1981, Sandra Lovelace, now a Canadian senator, petitioned the United Nations for the loss of her status when she married a non-Indigenous man. In her case, the committee declined to rule on sex discrimination, but ruled that Canada was in violation of an international covenant protecting culture, religion, and language. These events set the stage for future changes to the Indian Act to remedy the inherent sex discrimination. H.P. Ruddy said to my great-grandmother, when you married Joseph Gagne, a white man, you became a white woman. I have a picture of him, and you, you can tell he's not a white man. My father, William Vandell, who had passed in 1980, uh, a few years after that, my mother was interested to see if there had been any benefits for him or for myself as a minor child. So in December of 1983, my mother had a lawyer contact Indian and Northern Affairs requesting any information and uh, that at that time he, he would not have been entitled to any benefits. And this was in 83. I believe the law changed in 85, which would have reinstated him as it reinstated his mother. In 1985, Bill C-31 amended the Indian Act to address sex discrimination and bring it in line with Section 15 of Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Changes in Bill C-31 allowed many Indigenous women to reapply for their status as a 6-1 classification if they married a non-status man. However, Bill C-31 resulted in a new form of sex discrimination when the double mother rule was removed from the Indian Act in 1985. These changes meant that individuals who lost their status at age 21 as a result of the double mother rule were now able to have their status reinstated as 6-1 classification. Essentially, this meant that a status Indian man could transmit 6-1 status to his grandchildren and 6-2 status to his great-grandchildren. On the other hand, when a woman was reinstated, she would only transmit 6-2 status to her child and may not transmit status to her grandchild. Bill C-31 provided greater rights to Indian status men to pass down their status compared to Indian status women. 
You know, in 1985, when they amended the Indian Act, we all know that they, they didn't eliminate all the sex discrimination. They so-called bringing in legislation to bring the Indian Act in line with the Charter of Rights. The women weren't happy because the sex discrimination was just passed on to the children and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren. So in 1985, the amendment to the Indian Act was a failure. After 1985, all children of Indian men and Indian women who had children with a non-status person for two successive generations could not register for Indian status. This came to be known as the second generation cutoff. It continues to be applied equally to both sexes since this change. A person defined as 6'1 Indian had to have children with another 6'1 or 6'2 Indian to pass on 6'1 classification to their children. If a 6'1 Indian had children with a non-status person, their children would be classified as 6'2. If a 6'2 Indian had children with a non-status person, their children would not be able to register as a status Indian. Indigenous women continued to fight for equality. After applying for her Indian status in 1985, Sharon McIver received 6'2 status, but challenged the Indian Act through the Charter due to the continued sex discrimination. This battle would go on for many years. My heart wanted to know who my family was and where I belonged, so I began to send letters and asking for non-adoptive information, adoptive information, any kind of information that they could get me, right? And all the information that came back said, you're not an Indian. You're, you don't match up. It's uh, no, not at this time, right? That must have been about three times that they had told me that I was not an Indian. And that in itself is a very painful process to try to work through. I was ready to give up. Like I was ready to say, okay, well, maybe that's not my path. Maybe I'm not supposed to address this. This isn't my journey. It's not my fight. I am Indigenous. And even though you're trying to say that I'm not, you cannot take that out of my heart. I know in my heart that's who I am. I would say that the relationship between my grandmother and my, my father and myself uh, was disrupted because of colonization, you know. So I had to establish a relationship with her, which started through writing letters and phone calls. And she told me the story about her, her parents, Annie Jane Manasse and Joseph Gagne, and how Joseph Gagne was also Indian in his own right through his mother, Angeline Jocko. We managed to get her uh, Indian status and her mother Indian status. And that took a, a, a long process, just getting to know her through the oral tradition. And, uh, but then when um, they gave my father 6'2 status and they wouldn't give me status, I realized I had to move into archival research. People often will come here to look for genealogical records. So that might mean birth, marriage, or death records. Uh, often that will mean looking at church records as well, and they also will look for some government records. So if we have band lists, that sort of thing. And usually what will bring people in here is they are often looking for records to support status applications. So what we see here is what was called at that time the Indian name. So this would be their Blackfoot name. The date that they were admitted, their date of baptism, which for some children was the same date that they were admitted to the school, and their date of discharge. The name of their father, their mother, and then their band number. And for some people who are applying for status, they need that band number. And so it may seem like an untraditional place to look for records, but this, these types of records, these residential school records, can sometimes provide people with the information they need to put together a status application. If a person has more information, there's a better chance that we'll be able to be successful in our research. Pieces that would be really valuable when someone comes in would be if they have an idea of how old the person is that they are researching and how old they would have been at the time that they are researching and the time period and where they may have lived. It was hard. It was really hard. It's a whole science. And I was looking for a needle in the haystack. I was looking to link my great-great-grandmother, Angeline Jocko, to her brothers. It was hard, and, but I did it. 
And it took me uh, nine years just to do the oral family research and the archival research. And then uh, finally I applied in 1994. And um, I was... I didn't know how they were going to address the issue of unknown and unstated paternity, and then they assumed it was a white man and I was denied, even though I found that document to upgrade my grandmother and my great-grandmother. My father was still considered a 6'2 because of this issue of unknown and unstated paternity. They denied me Indian status, and then we had to, of course, take it to court. In 2001, Lynn Gale challenged the Indian Act because of unknown and thus unstated paternity in her lineage. She did not know who her paternal grandfather was. Through Indian and Northern Affairs, Canada's policies and practice, it was assumed that he was a non-Indian man, therefore his status was denied. This first statement of claim was struck, but the legal team was given permission to challenge the Indian Act through charter law. After years of affidavits, a discovery process, and expert reports, her case was heard in 2014. She lost. However, she was able to move her case to the Ontario Court of Appeal because of two errors of law. In the end, the Court of Appeal, relying on administrative law, ruled in her favour. Gail won her case and obtained 6-2 status. Hey, Charlie. Back in 2003, uh, I tried applying for my status. We really didn't know what would happen, uh, so I submitted an application. And at that point in time on the forum, I had to basically uh, do the genealogy, so showing my, my father and his parents and, and his grandparents going back to my grandmother. But I believe the law at the time only recognized the disenfranchised woman, who would have been my grandmother, Elizabeth, and her children, which would have been my father. So that made me ineligible. I did not become eligible until 2012. In 2007, after 20 years of litigation, Sharon McIver won when her son was granted 6-1 status, passing on status to his children. The British Columbia Supreme Court ruled to eliminate sex discrimination as far back as 1869. Canada appealed this decision to the British Columbia Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal ruled to include a 1951 cutoff date. As a result, in 2010, when Bill C-3 was enacted, much discrimination continued even though thousands could register for status. MacGyver then appealed to the Supreme Court, but they refused her appeal. She then took her case to the United Nations. I went ahead and I, I filled out all the paperwork again. And again, the paperwork came back, said my numbers don't match. <laughs> and it wasn't until I got out that poster board on Facebook and said, I need to find my birth family. And through that poster board, within three days, I found my mother, my brother, and a sister. Within a month, I was sitting with them. When I look back, I don't think I was asking the right questions to the right people. And I don't think that the right people were coming forward to help me with my journey. And uh, I think I really needed to deal with the anger. I was really, really mad. And that really doesn't support what I was trying to do. And so dealing with my own anger and my own, um, I guess, disappointment with the government, that they would not hear what I had to say. Legal challenges continued. Stefan Desjeneaux in Quebec fought for equality because his grandmother's marriage to a non-Indian man meant he couldn't pass his status on to his children. Deschanel won his case in 2015, which prompted Bill S-3 in 2016, and the bill passed in 2017, despite criticism that it hadn't eliminated all sex discrimination. Jeanette Laval lost her case at the Supreme Court of Canada, but in 1985, the, the um, uh, government decided to uh, fix that, fix the discrimination against Jeanette and those of us like Jeanette. And uh, there was no court that told them to do that. They recognized it as ongoing discrimination and they fixed it. And every conversation we've had around the Bill C-31, Bill uh, C-3, Bill S-3, is that the, uh, we want to make these amendments. Desjeno says we have to make these amendments. 
Uh, but we know that there's more sex discrimination in there. We know, and we're going to fix it um, uh, next week, next year, uh, next decade, next 50 years, whenever, whatever the time frame is. And so um, to be here again and to ask you again, uh, can you not look at the ongoing discrimination and fix it? It's not rocket science. Through pressure from other court challenges at the same time, like the Gale case and the UN ruling on MacGyver, that all sex discrimination be eliminated. Amendments to the bill had to be made by the Canadian government. By August 15, 2019, all known sex discrimination was removed. This bill was a response to a Quebec court case uh, dealing with the additional issues. So many Indigenous women for years who had been lobbying for justice were concerned that this bill didn't go far enough and that, in fact, it didn't live up to what the government's intent was. And, uh, and rightly so, they were anxious to, with this shot at it again, to get it done correctly this time. In 2017, when my case was heard and I won, and they said, you have 6-2, I was like, so I have a new form of sex discrimination. They didn't resolve it after all these years. I remember I started in 1985, and here it was 217, and I just have a new form of sex discrimination imposed on me. It was pretty disgusting. It was really sad. I knew that I was continued to face discrimination, but what took me a while to understand was that they, um, they didn't use charter law to make the decision, they used administrative law. Uh, and I was fed up and tired. So I wasn't really celebrating. I was pretty disgusted. Pretty disgusted with Canada. I couldn't believe that sex discrimination continued. Uh, I couldn't believe that we had this long history of challenging sex discrimination, beginning with Mary Two X Early and Yvonne Bedard and Jeanette Corbett Laval and Sandra Lovelace and Sharon MacGyver. We just couldn't get anywhere with Canada's laws. So I found my family, went and visited with them, came back with my mother's numbers. Well, that's when they accepted the government, right? And uh, when I received that paperwork, I broke down and I cried so hard because finally they see me as who I am supposed to be, which is an Indigenous woman. Because I've been told my whole life that I wasn't. I knew I was different, I just didn't know where, who I was. And when you have that void in your heart, you try to fill that up with anything. When I received that number, I stood in my power and went, not again. And you're not going to take anybody else down either. We deserve that. We owe it to our families. We owe it to the rest of the people, our people. That is why this work is so important. October of 2017, I applied again, and uh, I do have a letter coming back to me about uh, them receiving all my information. They did ask for my father's long form birth certificate, and almost exactly a year later to the day, I did actually receive my, my status. And so I have had that now since October of 2018. And then back in April, uh, I have one son, and uh, so back in April of 2019, we had sent in an application for him, and uh, just two weeks ago, we received his letter of status as well. Since the passing of Bill S-3 and additional amendments, thousands of people are now eligible to register for Indian status. You might be eligible if, your mother, grandmother, or great-grandmother lost their status as a result of marriage to a non-status person. Your siblings and cousins have status. Your parent or grandparent was omitted from the Indian Register 
because of their mother's marriage to a non-Indian man before April 17, 1985. If you have circumstantial evidence to identify or explain unstated or unknown paternity when you were previously ineligible for status because of the policies. To fill out the application for Indian status, you will need to provide information about yourself, your parents, and possibly your grandparents. This includes your legal name and birth certificate, First Nation or band name, registration numbers for direct relatives, your contact information. If you were adopted or you have unstated or unknown paternity, information may be harder to find. Research as much as possible for your application. The registrar can use discretion based on the probability that your relative had Indian status. You will be informed if they require more documentation. Hearing the voices of women and their descendants who were denied their rights of recognition of their heritage, recognition of their bloodlines, recognition of their culture, um, in engagement in their own communities. And I, I hope that this, it can't make up for what people have lost, but it can change it from here forward for those people who come forward to have their, their status uh, reclaimed, and it can change it for uh, future generations. Don't give up, please don't give up, okay? Because that's what they want you to do. <laughs> they want you to give up and, and they need to be responsible for what they've done so far. The reward for this for me is that I am somebody and the void is gone and it's filled with love and compassion for myself and the anger has moved on. And my family, my granddaughter. She's so proud of her grandma. So proud of her grandma. And that's all that matters, really, is allowing her to see her grandmother. And when she said, Grandma, I'm so proud of you for telling your story, how can I not? <laughs> So to me, that is the gift. Family. <laughs> That's what it is, it's family. Yeah, that is the gift too. So I hope you enjoyed that video. If you want to view the video again at any time or share the video, just go to our website, uh, www.fairpawlegalresources.ca, and it's always there available for viewing. So what is legal status? Indian status is the legal status of a person who is registered as an Indian under the Indian Act. Under the Act, status Indians, also known as registered Indians, may be eligible for a range of benefits, rights, programs, and services offered by the federal and provincial or territorial governments. If you're registered as a status Indian under the Indian Act, your name will be added to the Indian Register. Now, before I continue on, I would like to mention that we also have created, in addition to the Reclaiming Indian Status video that you just watched, we've also created this booklet on Reclaiming Indian Status that has uh, 
much of the information we're going to cover today, as well as all of the contact information. And it is also available for instant download on our website, or you can order hard copies um, through our website as well. Indigenous Services Canada maintains certain banned lists under Section 11 of the Indian Act. Bands also have the option of determining their own membership or leaving the decision to Indigenous Services Canada. Bands can assume control of its own members by developing its own membership rules following the process set out in Section 10 of the Indian Act or by negotiating a broader set of self-government legislation. Although there was lots of previous legislation affecting Indigenous status, for the purposes of this workshop, I will start with those that directly affected gender discrimination. In 1951, an act respecting Indians. The Indian Register was established to record all individuals entitled to re registration. The Indian Registrar can add or delete, if they are ineligible, names from that register. Individuals can protest additions or deletions from the register. When a male is added or deleted from the register, his wife and children are also added or deleted. Women who marry a non-Indian man are not eligible for registration and they were removed from ban lists upon marriage. Individuals are eligible for voluntary enfranchisement if they meet specific requirements. The wife and children of a man who is enfranchising must be clearly named on the order of enfranchisement to be removed from the register or they keep their status. The double mother rule was also introduced to remove status from grandchildren at age 21, whose mother and paternal grandmother both acquired status through marriage to an Indian. In 1985, Bill C-31, an act to amend the Indian Act was introduced. Women do not automatically join their husband's band through marriage. All enfranchisement provisions, both voluntary and involuntary, are removed and provisions are created to allow individuals, especially women who had lost status, to be reinstated as status Indians. Section 10 introduces the ability for Indian bands to determine their own membership codes and rules. Children are treated equally whether they're born in or out of wedlock and whether they are bi biological or adopted. The definition of child included in Section 2 of the Indian Act was modified to recognize a legally adopted child, not only a legally adopted Indian child, and child adopted in accordance with Indian custom. In 2011, we seen Bill C-3 passed a Gender Equity in Indian Registration Act came into force in response to the MacGyver versus Canada de decision. It addressed inequities relating to the removal of the double mother rule under Bill C-31 in 1985, which created an added benefit for the male line of a family. Grandchildren of women who lost status due to marrying a non-Indian man prior to 1985 became entitled to registration for the first time and it introduced the 1951 cutoff under section six sub one. And then two, in 2017, very recently, Bill S-3, an act to amend the Indian Act in response to the Superior Court of Quebec decision in Desjardins versus Canada, which came into force in response to the Desjardins versus Canada decision. Provisions related to siblings, cousins, it omitted or removed minors, and unknown or unstated parentage came into force on December 22nd, 2017. Provisions related to the removal of the 1951 cutoff 
will come into force at a later date after the consultation phase of the collaborative process. First Nations, Indigenous groups and impacted individuals will be consulted on how to implement the removal of the 1951 cutoff. So what is the 1951 cutoff? As of August 15, 2019, all descendants born prior to April 17, 1985, to women who lost Indian status or were removed from band lists because of their marriage to a man without status, dating back to 1869, will be entitled to registration, bringing them in line with the descendants of men who never lost their status. So just a graph on how the double mother rule works in Bill C-31. And of course, the second generation cutoff where um, one person with 6-1, when we're thinking blood quantum 6-1 status, that's somebody who's, uh, who, who has two parents that were, have status, um, they achieve 6-1 status. And if someone with 6-1 status marry, marries a non-Indigenous person, their children would then be granted 6-2 status. And then if someone with 6-2 status marries a non-Indigenous person, their children would wind up with no, uh, with no status. And of course, that's men with 6-1 and 6-2 status who marry women with no status. So are you eligible? Eligibility for Indian status under the Indian Act is based on the degree of descent from ancestors who were registered or were entitled to be registered. You may obtain Indian status if your parent, grandparent, or great-grandparent had status or were eligible for status on your mother or father's side. Questions to ask yourself. Does one of my relatives have status already? Did my mother, grandmother, or great-grandmother lose their status? If you answered yes to either of these questions, you may be eligible for Indian status. In general, you may be eligible for Indian status if at least one of your parents is or was registered or entitled to be registered under subsection 6 sub 1 of the Indian Act, or if both of your parents are registered under sex subsection 6-2 of the Indian Act. Remember, 6-1 is a person who, who have two parents that have status, and someone with a 6-2 has one parent with status and one parent with no status. So what is the difference, but what is section six anyway? Sex, section six of the Indian Act defines how a person is entitled to be registered under the Indian Act. The federal government has the sole authority through the Indian registrar to determine who is entitled to be registered. Persons registered with Indian status are eligible for services and benefits delivered through federal departments. Although registration is divided into two primary categories, which are commonly known as Section 6.1 and 6.2, individuals registered under Section 6.1 and 6.2 have the same access to services and benefits. So what is the difference between 6.1 and 6.2 status? A person may be registered under Section 6.1 if both of their parents are or were registered or entitled to be registered. There are 14 categories under Section 6.1 which identify how someone is entitled for registration. There is absolutely no difference in access to services and benefits available to registered Indians, whether an individual is registered under 6.1 or 6.2. However, the ability to pass Indian status vastly differs depending on whether a parent is registered under 6-1 or 6-2. So how does entitlement to Indian registration work? 
post-1985. The following diagrams show different parenting scenarios and how those individuals would be registered. If a person registered under Section 6.1 has a child with a person not entitled to uh, registration, a non-Indian, their child is entitled to registration under 6.2, which is figure 1D. There we go. Figure 1D. If a person registered under Section 6.2 as a child with a person not entitled to registration, non-Indian, their child will not be entitled to registration, as is the uh, diagram next to, so 1E. Entitlement to registration under the Indian Act is lost after two successive generations of parenting with a person not entitled to registration, a non-Indian. This is commonly known as the second generation cutoff and was introduced in the 1985 Bill C-31 amendments. Divisions of entitlement to registration have resulted in the perception of one category of registration being better than others. For example, many women who were reinstated under Section 61C following the 1985 amendments were labeled and treated differently, often negatively, than individuals who were entitled under Section 61A. There's no difference in access to government services and benefits available to registered Indians, only their ability to pass on entitlement to registration to their children, depending on who they parent with. Individuals registered under Section 61, parents with a non-Indian, their children will be entitled under Section 62. Individuals registered under 62 uh, that parent with a non-Indian, their children are not entitled to registration. For First Nations that control their own membership under Section 10, their membership code defines who is entitled to membership. This subsequently results in registered individuals being treated differently by First Nations in determining who can be band members depending on the category they're registered under. This perceived hierarchy or viewpoints that there are better categories of registration is often described by some as being discriminatory. This can create lines drawn within families and disconnections of community and family ties if individuals are not registered under the right category. There are many reasons why people would consider um, changing from a 6-2 to a 6-1 status. So if you've been affected by known sex-based inequalities in the Indian Act and already have status, the Indian, the Indian registrar can review your registration category under section six, and it could be amended, which you will find information specific to this on page seven of the booklet. To, requ to request a category amendment from section 6.2 to 6.1, you need to submit a photocopy of valid federal, provincial, and territorial or territorial government ID that includes your name, date of birth, photo, and signature. You must also send a signed and dated written request with your name, registration number, and mailing address. Keep in mind that the only difference between uh, section 6.1 and 6.2 is the ability to pass down uh, your status. And so, if you are a 6-2, in order to be able to continue passing down your status to your children, grandchildren, uh, if, if you can request a category amendment from a 6-2 to a 6-1, it doesn't change who you are or necessarily the benefits that come with the section 6-2 or 6-1, that's all the same. But who it will make a difference to is your children and grandchildren. And if it's something as simple as submitting a photocopy of valid ID and 
writing a signed and dated letter requesting that your name and red with your name and registration number and your mailing address uh, fairly simple and again isn't going to change your life any but will certainly make a huge difference to your children and grandchildren so then who qualifies right and so Status Indians are entitled to certain rights and benefits not available to those without status, stemming from treaties signed between the Crown and First Nation bands, which are still obligated to be fulfilled. So for example, non-insured health benefits, tax exemption, education, treaty annuity payments, and on-reserve income assistance programs. Some argue, though not ideal, being legally recognized as having Indian status affirms and maintains Indigenous identity. And so what are reasons? What are some reasons why people would even want to apply? Sure. There are some benefits, um, you know, medical and, and tax exemption, all of that. But ultimately, there Indigenous people are the only culture in Canada where the government uh, has free reign to determine our identities. You know, I was uh, trying to explain to my non-Indigenous husband why this is such a big deal. And my husband's family is Danish and, you know, a bunch of other stuff, but they identify with being Danish, Canadian, but Danish. And I simply said to him, how would you feel if the government came in and said, you're not pure blood, and so you are not entitled to lay claim to being Danish. And ultimately, it's about who we know we are and not having anybody, including the provincial and federal governments, telling us who we can or can't be. And so it's really about who and what do we identify with. You might also be interested to know that um, the federal government actually has a document that um, estimates when there will be no First Nation Treaty Indigenous people left in Canada and they will no longer have to honor the treaty. And so I think that it's important that we reclaim our identities and we, we gain the ability to pass on that identity to our children and grandchildren and so on and so on. Uh, if for any other reason, just to prove the government wrong. And in my opinion, so then who qualifies? Everyone now makes the same application for status. There used to be uh, different applications if you were applying under Bill C-31 or Bill S-3 or whatever. Now they've simplified the application process and everybody uses the same application form. Indigenous Services Canada now has the discretion, the option to grant status based on the probability or the likelihood that your relative had status or was eligible for status at some point. Knowing um, Indigenous history in Canada, um, there are so many Indigenous people that through residential school in the 60s scoop and, and the adoption process that um, have lost connection to their families, their communities, their clans. Um, and even though we are responsible for performing family searches, sometimes it is almost impossible, if not impossible, to retrace those connections. And so Bill S3 now gives the registrar discretion to grant somebody status based on the likelihood that they would be entitled to treaty status. And so now 
even if we don't find those established connections, those family connections, still make an application. Uh, if you truly believe that through your family history that you would have been entitled to treaty status, make that application. Bill S-3 has, with the changes that Bill S-3 has made, they estimate that there is almost half a million Indigenous people in Canada that are now eligible for treaty status. And so make the application. Everybody make the application. Applicants are required to submit documentation along with their application form. The required documentation depends on the age of the applicant and whether the applicant is applying in person or by mail. If an adult 16 or older is applying in person, applicants must provide the following uh, documentation. An original birth certificate. The birth certificate must contain the parents' names. To obtain this birth certificate, applicants must contact the vital statistics website of the province or territory where they were born. An original acceptable valid identification as well. If an adult is applying by mail, applicants must provide an original birth certificate. The birth certificate must contain the parents' names. It cannot be a photocopy. It must be the original. You will get that back. A photocopy of the front and back of an acceptable valid piece of identification. Each photo must be signed by a, gar a guarantor. A guarantor declaration. If the name on the application form is different than the name on any of the other required supporting documentation, applicants must then either provide an original legal document linking the applicant's previous name to their current name, such as a marriage certificate or a divorce paper, or a photocopy of a name linking document, an acceptable valid identification, such as a driver's license, with the applicant's name as it appears on the application form. If the application is for a dependent adult, applicants must provide the order of guardianship as well. All legal guardians on the order of guardianship must also sign the application form. So then who can be a guarantor? And I know that this is a ton of information and um, and it, it's, you're not going to remember it all. However, um, you will find all of this information in the booklet, Reclaiming Indian Status on our website. And so you don't need to worry about scribbling down notes like furiously, um, just find our, our uh, booklet. So who can be a guarantor? A guarantor is a person who is 18 years or older who can confirm your identity for your application for Indian status or a status card. You need a guarantor if you're applying by mail or you're providing a valid identification that doesn't meet all the requirements, your name, date of birth and photo and signature. So the guarantor must be 18 or older, live in Canada or the United States for that matter, be able to be contacted by phone by Indigenous Services Canada to confirm information about you. They must have known you personally for at least two years. They have to be able to confirm your name, age, date of birth, uh, physical description, and some personal history. For example, where you currently live. They must also be a person with a valid status card and applied for it when they were 16 or older. or be a person working in any of the following professions, an elected or appointed official, including band chief or counsel, a judge or some other justice personnel and police, lawyers, medical professionals, minister of a religion, social worker, educator, professional accountants or engineers, or military personnel. The Guarantor Declaration form website link can be found in the booklet. 
the only thing that anybody needs to prove in the application process is kinship. Kinship. So when you're completing the application form, applicants will be required to prove kinship, who you're related to, who you're connected to, in order to demonstrate your ability for Indian status. The documentation required to prove kinship depends in part on the applicant's circumstances. So every applicant is individual and unique in circumstances. In section three, required documentation of the application form, the applicant will be required to submit a proof of birth document, so a birth certificate. The document must be original. It must list the names of both parents. It must be in English or French. Acceptable proof of birth documents include a birth certificate, a Quebec birth certificate, um, a Quebec birth certificate with a place of birth outside of Quebec, a baptismal certificate, um, a Canadian vital statistics birth extract, a birth certificate issued in the United States, or a birth certificate and registration of birth issued in a country other than Canada or the United States. So ultimately, a birth certificate. In Section 5, Family Information, applicants will be required to provide information about their family in order to prove kinship. In that section, applicants must provide family information, a genealogy, uh, which is a family chart, up to the first registered family member. So you don't have to go back till you know, the time when um, your family first began, um, you may only have to go back one or two or three generations. You only go back as far as the last registered person in your family. For example, if it's your grandmother that was registered, information on maternal grandparents and great, great grandparents are not required. To trace a genealogy, applicants can use the Ancestors Search tool provided by Library and Archives Canada. And I found that they had some very useful tools on that website. If available, the registration number, the 10-digit number, and the band name of family members. The absence of these registration numbers could delay your application. If unable to provide information on the applicant's grandparents and great-grandparents, information on other relatives in the additional family information section, such as maybe you have cousins, first cousins that are uh, have status. And so providing that uh, lateral uh, kinship may also be able to prove likelihood. So you should include information such as last and first names, any known aliases or maiden names, relationship, date of birth, and band name. So proving who you belong to. Your birth certificate helps determine your entitlement to registration based on your parents' entitlement. It's evidence of your parentage. If one of your biological parents is not listed on your birth certificate, the Indian Register may ask that you change your birth certificate to include both. If it's not possible to change the birth certificate, the Indian Register may accept a statutory declaration signed by one or both of the biological parent, by a member of the unstated parent's immediate family, or by a close relative or elder that confirms the identity of the unstated parent. Following the Gale decision and Bill S-3, other evidence can be submitted to establish Indian parentage, including, but not limited to, amended long form birth certificates, statutory declarations, census records, court documents, church, school, or hospital records, and ban council resolutions. The Indian Register must consider all relevant evidence and assess it based on the known challenges to getting certain pieces of evidence, like historical records, and take into account 
a person's circumstances that can justify the inability to produce information about relatives. The Indian Register decides Indian parentage on the standard of balance of probabilities. The determination must answer this question. Has the applicant established that it is more probable than not that the parent, grandparent, or ancestor is, was, or would have been entitled to be registered? If an applicant is adopted, they will need to complete an application form. They must provide an original post-adoption, so after adoption birth certificate, listing their adoptive parents' names. You can also provide the pre-adoption, so before adoption birth certificate, listing birth, birth parents' names, if that's available. A photocopy of adoption order, or photocopy of letter from social services confirming the details of the adoption. As well, a letter outlining any information about biological family members who have or had Indian status, if possible. Now there's also the, uh, the issue of legal versus custom adoption. A legal adoption is processed by the courts and includes legal documents and an adoption order. A custom adoption is done in accordance with Indigenous customs. Applicants who were adopted as minors by Indian parents through legal or custom adoptions can register for Indian status. And for more information on this, you can consult our booklet. We also have a website to Indigenous Services Canada uh, that will also outline more information on this. If you have questions, contact the adoption unit by email at aadnc.infopubs.aandc.canada.ca. According to the Government of Canada, the application process for Indian status consists of four steps. Get the application form. Applicants must retrieve the application for registration on the Indian Register and for the Secure Certificate of Indian Status form, the SCIS. You can get it online, by mail, by calling Indigenous Services Canada, Public Inquiries, or in person at any INAC regional office. I know there's one in Edmonton at Canada Place. They'll need to find a guarantor complete the application form and sign and date the completed application form. Prior to submitting or sending the application form, applicants should make sure that they have completed all of the relevant sections, including the checklist of required documentation and signed and dated the form. If the applicant is for a child or dependent adult, a parent or a legal guardian must sign the application form. Once the application has been received, the Indian Register will acknowledge the receipt by mail. Applicants are advised to keep the letter for their own records, as this receipt will contain the file number for their application. All original documents, except for statutory and guarantor declarations submitted with the application, will be returned to the applicant by mail. According to the INAC website, they will try to have all of the original documents returned to the applicant within one month of receiving the application. So then where do you apply? Where do you apply? You can submit your application in the following ways to any Indigenous Services Canada regional office, to any First Nation or band office, or by mail to the National Processing Unit, Indigenous Services Canada, and the address 
is in our booklet on page 12. I've even included all of the page numbers for you so that you have, uh, so you will have no trouble finding it. So in our booklet, we do try to keep all of the information um, easy to find for you. So then after you apply, currently, and this was a year ago, so I'm going to go out on a limb and say that a year ago, there was up to a two year wait list for applications to be processed. I suspect that it could be even longer than that. If the application has been completed properly and the applicant is entitled to be registered for Indian status, they will receive a letter with a 10 digit registration number and a temporary confirmation of registration document. This letter will confirm that the applicant is registered for Indian status and eligible for the benefits and rights prescribed by the Indian Act. Eligible applicants should also receive a secure status card within the 16 weeks of receiving the letter. If the Indian registrar rejects the application, uh, and has determined that the applicant is not entitled to be registered for Indian status, the applicant will receive a letter with a rationale for their decision. Once the application is approved and you're registered for Indian status, if your First Nation is responsible for determining its own membership, INAC will direct you to your band to apply for membership. If your First Nation is not responsible for determining its own membership, you will automatically become a member of your First Nations band. You can also launch something called protests. So if you've been declined for treaty status, uh, so you don't agree with the Indian Register's decision on your application, you can appeal it by submitting a protest. A protest must Briefly state the reason by describing how the Indian Act may have been misinterpreted or by indicating what evidence may have been overlooked in the decision. By submitting in writing to the Indian Registrar within three years from the decision by the person directly impacted by the decision or their authorized representative, such as a lawyer, band counsel, or band member. And information on how to uh, submit a protest is found on page 16 in our booklet. There's a distinction between a status card and a se secure status card. With a, se with a secure status card, individuals can travel across the Canadian-American border by land or by sea. Some First Nations are still issuing certificates of Indian status also referred to as status cards. If this applies to the applicant's band, they can either fill out the application for a certificate of Indian status or apply in person at their band office, Indian Registration Administrator. To apply for a secure certificate of Indian status, also referred to as a secure status card, the applicant or the child or dependent adult they are applying for must be registered as a status Indian under the Indian Act. If the applicant is not yet registered as a status Indian, they can apply for both registration and a secure status card at the same time. And again, the instructions on how to make those applications for status card or a secure status card can be found in our booklet. Um, it, there are differences in process depending on whether you're applying in person or by mail. Uh, the required documentation changes again depending on in person or by mail. According to the Government of Alberta website, there are three steps to apply for a secure status card. You need to get the application form. Uh, you can retrieve the secure certificate of Indian status application for already registered persons online by calling or in person at any INAC regional office. Fill out and sign the application form and submit or send the application. 
Prior to submitting or sending the application, applicants should make sure that they have filled out all the relevant sections and signed and dated that form. And just some resource links of our booklet. I've also included um, Indigenous Services Canada's website has two charts that they recognize um, that they use. And so I recommend that uh, you utilize, and there's the direct links to those charts um, that I recommend that you do use the pedigree or family chart found there uh, simply because it's something that their department is familiar with. Um, and also the video and booklet are available on our website. So then how do you begin your family search? That's a big one, right? Um, not even sure where to start. I get you. I hear you. Start with yourself and work backwards. That's the simplest and, and, and most organized way of starting that search because it's going to be an overwhelming amount of search. Talk to everyone around you. Gather your family's documents and record the details and be methodical about it start a binder or if you're really tech savvy, start a, a filing system in your computer, um, but keep the information together in one place and keep it organized. So choose the approach you want to use for your research. If you're more of a pen and paper kind of person, start a binder. Binders work great too. Don't expect to find your complete family history on the internet and in fact, um, indigenous families, not a lot of information on the internet. Uh, I spent a fair amount of money on one of those uh, family genealogy uh, websites and, you know, did the old spit DNA test thing. And I still have not received any or, or not many um, links to indigenous family. Uh, so I just don't think that we are quite there yet. Uh, expect to discover family secrets. Every family has skeletons in the closet. And once you start doing your family search, you are going to stumble across some. Don't expect someone to do your research for you. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just express an interest and then have someone take the ball and run with it. However, that being said, I would like to mention that the Alberta Provincial Archives in Edmonton have a department of researchers that will assist people in, uh, in, in doing their family search. They will look at baptismal records, uh, military records, uh, adoption records if they have them. So anything that they have in their, in their uh, archives, uh, they will actually do that research for you. And so um, you can contact them for that. So there is someone that will do some of the research for you. Give credit where credit is due. And what I mean by this is make sure that you write down note where you received all of your information. So note the sources because you never know when you're going to need to go back to that source to double check or get more information. Visit local libraries and archives. Join a local genealogy society if there are any. Uh, here's a, a, here's um, examples of those two forms uh, family search charts that I had told you about. The one on the left is the pedigree chart. The one on the right is the family chart. And they're both quite adequate. Um, and again, the, the positive in using these forms is that they're in a format that the government is familiar with. So uh, certainly it's something that you may want to consider using. So what do you need to do? First and foremost, 
organize your information. Make sure to make copies, have a backup. Um, if, you, uh, if you are tech savvy and you are scanning everything and saving them into a file, make sure that you back up your information regularly because all you need is your computer to crash and all of your information is gone. And if it's paper, make sure you make a photocopy. You have backups there too. Uh, pedigree and family charts, as I had shown, there's an example there. Uh, there are computer methods if you are interested in uh, creating a formal family search and don't mind paying a little bit of money. Um, there are um, search family search programs, computer programs that are available as well, or pen and paper manual method, creating a, a binder with uh, dividers and, and keeping everything organized that way. Preserve your artifacts, cite your sources, know where everything came from in case you need to go back. Um, remember names, places, dates uh, of all of the events. Uh, no, no information is too big or too little to record somewhere. Where to find help and resources. Um, there is Indigenous Services Canada, Alberta Regional Office, which are available to assist you. Um, there's the toll-free phone number for uh, Indigenous Services Canada, they can assist you. But all of this contact information is available in the booklet. Family Search Resources, Alberta Archives for Historic Records, and there's the phone number and the email address. Library and Archives Canada, Vital Statistics in Alberta for Birth, Death and Marriage Certificates or Records, um, they also have services available for the deaf or hard of hearing. And so that concludes uh, the, the fairly recent information on Bill S3 and hopefully provides you with a, a starting place on, on uh, family search and gives you a lot more information on not just how to apply for treaty status, but also why. It's a lot of work. So um, why would it be important to people to make that application for their treaty status? Um, again, uh, if you want to get more information or just have the information at your fingertips, Consult our website, www.bearpawlegalresources.ca, and our video and our booklet are um, available for viewing or download or even ordering. Another booklet that we created uh, several years ago, but that will also help you to, um, to, to perform a family search. Uh, particularly for people that were adopted, um, is how to find your biological family in Alberta, which gives adopted persons the uh, process on how to access their, uh, their birth family's information. And so this booklet is also available on our website. Uh, www.bearpawlegalresources.ca. So hopefully you found this webinar uh, informative, gives you more ideas on whether you want to make an application for treaty status, and if so, how to go about doing it. So have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>